So in this session, we find ourselves in um, in this in largely in the '60s and '70s, um, and geographically speaking, we're uh, we're located in the former Soviet, by and large, the former Soviet satellite countries. Um, and so we're going to go through a few examples uh, from various different places of the eastern of the Eastern Bloc. Um, so former Eastern and Central Europe. Um, and we're going to look at some of the practices, the participatory practices that, that, uh, that, that came out of there. And we're going to talk about some of the, of the common themes and common strategies of, of these works. And then the, 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 you know, the central aspect of, of this session is to then think about Jean-Luc Nancy's inoperative community in relation to these to these works. So the last half of this session will be me trying to guide you and help you in approaching uh, Nossi's inoperative community, a reading of that, that text. So where are we? Um, I think it's nice to, to put, put up a map, a map here. Um, we're in the post-war, uh, post-World War II context, uh, in the full, the, the full um, height of the Cold War. Um, and we have uh, different satellite countries of Eastern and Central uh, Europe, like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, and so on. Um, and so if anyone wants a history, um, you know, a somewhat quick but really quite brilliant history of, um, of, of, of this area in the 1960s, I can't recommend enough Tony Jutt's Post-War, which is a large book from the post, post-war from 1945 uh, to the early 21st century, and each chapter goes in-depth on that specific stopping point. So one of the chapters is about this area. Um, and the, the, the rule of, of, the, of, of Moscow, of the, you know, the central um, command of the Soviet Union on these satellite on these satellite countries. So a lot of the works that um, Claire Bishop talks about um, come from these, um, these satellite countries, um, though she also talks about Moscow conceptualism. And so let's just go through, uh, let's go through a few. I'm gonna give you uh, some examples that are in, the, in Artificial Hells and some um, that, that are not. Um, and we're actually gonna start at the end of, the, the end of this story, um, which is also the beginning of another story that we're currently living through. Uh, which would be the fall of the Soviet Union, which means the end of of uh, these satellite states as being part of of, of the Soviet Union. So uh, Hungary, Yugoslavia, um, uh, Poland, Albania, all these countries gaining their sovereignty and independence after the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, of the Iron Curtain, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union and then the, the, the end of the, the official end of the, of, of the, cold, of the cold War, which uh, was widely seen in the late 80s and early 90s as this victory for liberal market capitalist uh, society. Um, as as um, Francis Fukuyama wrote very famously as the end of history, where essentially uh, all political ideolo ideologies have been tried out, have been troubleshooted, and it's clear now that the best one and the one that everyone should just go with is a liberal capitalist, um, um, as a liberal capitalist um, uh, society. So, uh, so we're working within 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 this 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 context and working on tracing the, this history, and we're starting at the end. This is Harun Faroqi's uh, um, film work called Videograms of a Revolution, which is really incredible. I highly recommend watching it. Uh, it, he's using a footage, this is well before um, we had cell phones and everyone could, could record everything. Um, there are only a few uh, video recordings of this event, but this is, this is uh, a film that, that uses archival footage of Ceausescu's uh, last speech in Romania. He was the, he was the, the last leader, uh, dictator of, of Romania when it was uh, still communist, when it was still part of the Soviet Union. Um, he's giving a speech, and everyone outside uh, gets really restless. And ultimately, <clears throat> there's a revolution. There's a there's a there's an uprising. Um, the image you're seeing on the left is Ceausescu. Uh, the image image on the right are protesters and activists 
who have taken over the, the, the state television, um, giving us all peace signs, um, and o basically overthrowing this uh, very repressive regime of, Ceces of Ceausescu. So it's, it's an incredible work, um, and, it, and it attests to the fall of really existing socialism and of communist rule of, the, of, 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 of Moscow and of the, the Sov Soviet Union. Um, and so this work is from 1992, very fresh, uh, because of course the end of the fall of the Berlin Wall is 89 and the fall of the Soviet Union is 1991, uh, so it's very fresh. But the works that we look at um, come at a time when there was um, more or less total control over these, these satellite countries from Moscow, from the, from the Central Command in the, in, in, uh, in the Soviet Union. And so we can look at a number of different works that come from these these satellite these satellite countries. Um, uh, this is uh, Abramovich, so incredibly famous artist. I'm sure I'm sure you 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 know her. This is a, an early work of hers called Rhythm Zero, from 1974. So here we're in the Yugoslavian context, um, and the premise was very simple. Uh, but to think through what happened and what it means for the conception of being together is very profound um, and, and very um, very thought-provoking. So she's in a gallery and there are these various objects on a, on a table um, and she basically says to the audience, to the participants, who are very much part of the work, this is a participatory work, a very early one, um, says you can, you, you can use these objects and do what you will with them and do what you will with them to me. I'm simply going to be an object standing here. And this is a performance that lasts, I mean, it's really durational and it's really intense. It lasts, it lasts six hours. Um, and the way the, the stories go, like the, the, the way in which this is documented, is that the audience, the participants, start in a very sort of gentle, playful way. But then over the course of this, these six hours, it really starts to get, it starts to escalate and gets really extreme. And the most extreme point is when one participant takes a gun uh, that's on the table that has a bullet in it and and puts it in her hand and she and, and has her pointed towards herself in which I think the gallery owner then went and took the gun and threw it out um, uh, just said this is this is this is going to going too far um, and so this is a, a really intense durational performance work that involves the public and interestingly enough involves the public as um, a group that maybe this is something we can relate to Nancy, I think, when we talk about this at the end of this session. Maybe the group loses its head. Uh, maybe the group fuses into this, um, into this mob mentality that allows them to do things that they otherwise wouldn't just on their, just on their own if they were face-to-face -face with the Bravish. Um, so that's one of the many rich ways in which to talk about this this very uh, complicated work, which again is within the Yugoslavian context, um, in the mid in the mid seventies. Um, <clears throat> here's here's another one. Uh, this is uh, this is the Czech context, so in Prague, um, and Bishop talks about uh, Milan Nijak um, at a number of points and brings up a number of his works. So we'll talk more about him and look at more works when we get together and, and discuss. Uh, but this is one of his works, Demonstration to Oneself, where he goes out into public and he's laying on the ground and he has certain d directions that he's given to himself and I can read them really quickly here. Um, he says, uh, stand still in a crowd, unfold a piece of paper, stand on it, take off your ordinary clothes and put on something unusual. For example, a jacket half red, half green with a tiny saw hanging from the lapel, a lace handkerchief, uh, pinned on the back. Display a poster on which is written, I beg the passers-by, if possible, while passing this place, to crow. So in this very absurd sort of way, the sign is telling people to crow, to make the sounds of a, of a, of a crow. Um, lie down on the piece of paper, read a book, tear out the finished pages, then stand up, crumple the paper, burn it, sweep up the ashes carefully, change your clothes, and leave. So it's this very. It's almost like he he as as as, as you'll read as you'll come to know he doesn't really uh, find an affinity with happenings. He wants to talk. He wants to talk about his work as actions, 
but it does feel almost like a happening for oneself. He calls it demonstration for oneself, but this is almost like this absurd happening of going out in public and doing these things that are that are that are quite quite mystifying. So this is an example. This is in Czechoslovakia, um, in Prague, before uh, 1968 and before um, the the crackdown and the and the the quote unquote normalization of Czechoslovakia by the, the Soviet Union, in which then it became much more perilous to do a work, uh, to, to work like this, or to write freely. Um, also in Czechoslovakia, we'll come to meet Alex Milarczyk, um, along with Stan Ophilko and Zita Kostrova. Uh, uh, and this is Hapsok 1, uh, which was an event f uh, that lasted a week from uh, May 2nd to May 9th in 1965. Um, and it was essentially treating the, the, the city of Bratislava um, as, uh, as a ready-made. So uh, they, for that one week, the city was dubbed to be an artwork. Only a few people, 400 participants, would understand this, would, would know uh, that, that the city was an artwork for that one week. And so the idea was to, experiencing, to experience the city as like a, a doubly, so like both as a real thing, but also as a conceptual artwork. But of course, everyone that lived in Pratislava at that time, whether they knew it or not, were, they were art for that week. They were part of this participatory artwork, whether they knew it or not. Uh, and so m one of the many interesting ideas that come out of this is the idea of forced participation. Uh, the idea of these people didn't know the, uh, they, were, they, were, they were participating, but they were participating nonetheless. So that's a, a really interesting aspect of this, of, of this work. Um, we also have um, Jan Mlosch, his classic Escape from, from 1977. Uh, and this is, I, I, in some ways, uh, uh, a, a dark, a dark work, um, like a, almost an agoraphobic work, a fear of of, of others, um, but it, but essentially it was him. There was in in a room. He kicks everybody out. Uh, so this is the opposite. Uh, Bishop points this out. This is like the the very opposite of Carnavale, uh, and uh, and enclosing people into a gallery. This is expelling them from the space, and then secretly escaping out the back window. Um, and leaving the space, the space himself. So, uh, a really, a really fascinating work. Um, here's another work. Um, so this is also this is also in uh, in, in in Prague. This is Jiri Kavanda, who does these really understated works, almost like invisible theater, but it's invisible to everybody. He doesn't have anyone else sort of collaborating with him. It would be him going out into public in 1977. And doing these very surreptitious, secret, but very minor works of art, where he would just—it was just like a very slight behavioral modification that would then get dom documented, and then it would be shown with with the text. Um, and so you'll read about a number of these in the text. But this is one I've always really enjoyed and find compelling. It's simple. He's going up an escalator, and at some point he turns around and stares into the eyes of the person that's standing behind him as he finishes, as they finish their ride up, up the escalator. Um, and I find this fascinating for a number of reasons, mainly because uh, by all accounts, Kavanda was incredibly shy. And so the work, the, the, the way in which uh, he put himself into the public space in these small, but maybe slightly bizarre um, uh, mod modifications of behavior uh, must have been difficult for him. Um, I'd actually find it myself really difficult to, to do to do what he does here um, to, to go on an escalator and then turn around and just stare at somebody I'm sure you would make that other person very uneasy um, another work uh, John Budage this is the lunch from, from 1978 uh, this is a wonderful work where he invites uh, a few friends to come and eat together have a conversation um, with the stipulation that their conversation will be um, broadcast through speakers. So a very rich work to talk about, especially within the context of, of, of a repressive 
uh, of a repressive um, uh, political and social landscape. Um, and this is, I think, of all the works, I think all the works have a um, have have a, have a, an instance of this. But of all the works, this is the one that most closely aligns with the strategy of over identification, uh, which is the idea of like taking on the thing you're critiquing to show um, uh, to show its absurdity or, or to show its problematic nature. So clearly, in this one, it's taking on the idea of being surveyed. Of, of, of a wiretapping, of phone tapping, and so on and so forth, um, and of a, a private space no longer being private, like it also being part of the ideological apparatus of a managed um, uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, society. And our last example, and the last um, artist that, that Bishop talks about in her chapter, uh, here we go to, to Moscow, so here we're in, in um, present-day present day Russia with the Collective Actions Group um, who did these wonderful, wonderful works, very enigmatic uh, and very interesting to talk about. This is 10 Appearances from 1981, um, and it's, it's a very simple premise, but again, uh, with a lot of these works, the premise, premise is simple, but what they mean and, and where they lead us in conversation. They all get to get this remote forest area. They each are given a spool of, of, of yarn, of string, which then in opposite directions from each other, they're meant to un unfold, unspool the, 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 the string um, until the string runs out. And there's a piece of paper documenting the, 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 the performance of this event. And then they're free to do what they think is, is proper. Um, and so according to the documentation, eight of them, eight of the ten participants come back, but two just decide to go back to the, to, to the city. Um, and the idea is not only to experience this event, but also then for that event to sort of change your quotidian existence, change like your everyday life. You'll think about it as you go back um, and it becomes a topic of conversation and you've experienced something that um, that alters or change changes even in a minor way um, your, 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 your every everyday life. So all these practices that, that we've we, we've talked about, um, we were in Romania, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, um, and, uh, and and now, uh, now now Moscow, now Russia. Um, all of these are disparate practices um, and their differences I think we definitely want to account for and talk about when we get together. But I think there are a few things that hold them in common. So obviously these are all works of art that happened under Soviet rule in the Eastern Bloc, which was often under strict strict control. If you read this history, you'll, you'll, you'll read a history of the secret police um, of censorship and surveillance. And here I can't help but plug a movie. If you've never seen the film The Lives of Others, it's a German film. It's incredible. Um, it's, it's, a, it's highly worth watching. Um, check out Lives of Others if you've never, never seen it. It gets to the, I mean, it's a perfect encapsulation of a secret police surveillance state under a form, it's, uh, in a former Soviet context. Um, and, and also economic and cultural control, control, right? Which includes writers and philosophers and artists. Um, you had to abide by the Union of Soviet Artists, um, which proselytized for um, uh, socialist realism, so for very realistic patriotic forms of, of art making. So all of these works that we've just gone through very much go against the grain of the demands of the state as to what art should look like and what art should be. Um, so the social and political setting for all of these works is one of coerced collectivity. This is the important idea here, maybe the most important idea in Bishop's chapter. Um, so in other words, social participation is required by the ruling ideology, so much so that even private experiences uh, are dictated to be shared and to be exposed and to be uh, part of the public um, um, public knowledge all of course is a form of of con of control um, so what is part what happens to participation 
what happens to community when it's coerced, when it's forced, um, when it falls into um, a, a, like a collective mass body. Uh, this is an important question for the history of participatory art, but also a really important question for Jean-Luc Nancy's work, which we're going to talk about in a, a moment. And so as Bishop points out, the works, the participatory works that, that we look at, um, they had to be done in secret. They had to be ephemeral, they had to be out of the way, and they had to be enacted only with trusted friends. And so uh, another thing that Bishop often reiter reiterates um, off of these observations is the claim that these, were not, these works are not political, that we shouldn't think of them as political but instead that they were enacting existential acts of individual freedom. So rather than agitating for social equality, um, for, 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 for political change, um, they were more modestly forms of, you know, uh, instances of individual uh, uh, freedom. Um, and this will be interesting to, to talk about, um, whether or not we agree with the reading of these works as, as largely apolitical, um, or uh, something I, I find that could be compelling to think through is to, is to think of these works that as political, but not as political agitation, but as expanding or altering what we even mean by uh, a political work, work of art. Um, because one of the common themes I think that, that we can see running through most of these works is an impulse or a desire to take private life into the public sphere. Um, and oddly enough, what happens to the private when it's taken to the, to the public, uh, into the public sphere? Uh, because it's transgressive, because it's uh, even, even if it's a minor transgression, uh, because it's really, uh, even if it's very low key, um, it, there's still in a way, because it's an, an action, an aesthetic moment, uh, it's a moment in which the private becomes more free. Oddly enough, it feels like it becomes more free within a public, a public setting, rather than if it were simply private. And then you know, the, the thought that ideology is is um, is dictating and all, all 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 around us. So there's a way in which uh, we could read this work as a as a politics of taking the private into the public in order to make the public, uh, in order to make the private a more freeing experience uh, and, a, and a more transgressive experience um, and also as a moment of over identification we, we talked about a moment ago which inherently has a, a political stridency to it even even in its most subtle coded subtle and coded form but above all I think that uh, these works force us to think about community and conviviality which are so central to participatory art as a problem. Um, so unlike in Western Europe and Latin America at the same time, which we've already studied, the artists undergoing really existing socialism seem to be more about separation, about breaking the totalitarian grip of collectivity and living together um, and reintroducing micro freedoms and private experience rather than going towards uh, community, um, lamenting the loss of community, the lamenting the loss of conviviality, and so on and so forth, um, they seem to be doing something slightly different. One that keeps community at arm's length, um, and as we're going to turn to now, um, possibly as a form of unworking the community and collectivity and forced participation. And so it's th with this history in mind that it becomes really interesting to go back and read a very important text in philosophy by Jean-Luc Nancy, the French philosopher, um, called The Inoperative Community, which he wrote. It's a collection of essays that he wrote in the late 80s, and it was published as, as a text, as one whole text, in 1991. And so why is this an interesting text to, to read alongside this, these works that we just looked at and this history that we're tracing? Well, it's because it's one, one, of, one of its great merits is to reconceive the notion of community as precisely not simply a social body coming together. Um, uh, his, one of the key claims in this book is that no one has really thought what community is, um, what it means for human beings. Um, and he does leave the door open at one point in the text uh, to, 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 to think 
past to think beyond simply the the human being or the the, the communitarianism of the human being to expand it to other other forms of beings on this planet um, but but he he'll he'll argue that the notion of community what community is um, from a rigorous you know philosophical conceptual standpoint has been left um, un, unthought um, and worse um, it's been uh, manipulated or used nefariously or for ends that 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 actually negate community so th this is one of the key things that we'll be talking about in the in this um, in this final final section and so this is a really difficult text this is the height of French uh, French theory and so what I'm gonna do is just I'm gonna I'm gonna go through some of the arguments I'm gonna go through some of the key terms and ideas um, to help to help guide you in your reading So when you go to read the excerpt that we have for, for, the, for this text, I want you to approach it this way. I want you to think, uh, that, and keep in mind that Nasi has two main targets in this text. And these aren't extricable from each other. They're working in tandem. And the first is the pure individual, which for him is impossible. So here Nasi is taking on the history of, of the, the, the staple of liberal uh, of liberal politics, the idea that so society starts with the individual and works from there, um, that the individual is the atom, the kernel of of society and of politics and democracy and so on and so forth. Right? Um, so that's one of his his targets. The other target is on the end, the other end of the ideological spectrum, and that's the idea of the pure collective body. Um, and both of these targets, uh, both of the, both of these uh, lineages, he takes on and accuses them of of losing sight of of community. So the first negates community through atomization, an idea that we've talked about with the Situationist International, which is the separation of social bonds of of becoming um, atomized of, of a society in which we're we're scattered and left to our own devices. Uh, whereas the other negates community by totalizing. And this is where he plays off this word, word uh, a number of times in the text. Totalitarian, totalizing, total. These are words that, that it's, it's a whole constellation of collapsing into one imminent structure, um, into an undifferentiated mass, uh, which is also a way of betraying uh, community, according to, according to, according to Nancy. And so let's begin with the first, the first target. Um, and this is the impossible imminence of the individual. Imminence is a word that he uses quite often in this text. And imminence can have a few, a few uh, different meanings. The way you want to think of imminent or imminence in this text is the idea of an entity that has no outside, um, that has no difference within itself. It's almost like um, a homogenous entity, right? Um, but not only that, that it exists only for itself, like a self-sufficient thing, right? Um, so uh, the imminent individual, thinking of ourselves as imminent individuals, is to think of ourselves as completely independent and completely whole um, um, within, you know, within society or ourself self-conception and so as i was just saying nasi thinks that this is an impossibility and he even goes so far as to say that that the word individual um, individuation is one that's misleading it's one that we should replace and he favors the term singular or singularity um, which, which is interesting because a few years after this text, he'll publish another work that's, that's become very important called Being Singular Plural. Um, and it's an interesting tense, singular plural. Uh, and the idea there is that f f for him, what it means to be an individual is not to be this self-sufficient atom floating around society, but it's actually to be a singular entity to ha that has finitude, that has uh, limitations, uh, but one that is only um, uh, only has meaning in relation to the plurality of others, right? So 
this tense of being singular plural um, is an idea of 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 being of existence as one that's inherently relational and so if you ever go and read being singular plural you'll start to see oh wow i i'm, I'm i saw the kernel of this idea this new idea of subjectivity as being singular plural i saw this seed already being planted in the inoperative community this, these are fascinating texts to read to read together but coming back to to what we're doing right here so He's trying to point out the impossibility of the of an individual as imminent, um, and this he's doing to, to contradict atomistic societies. And he doesn't talk about atomistic societies very much in this in this text. More so in the preface, which unfortunately isn't excerpted for you. So if you ever read the whole the whole text, if you ever pick up the book, um, the preface is just a beautiful piece of writing. It's very short, very beautiful, but it contains a lot. In that text, he does talk a little bit about atomistic societies, and he's clear. Um, he says he, he doesn't want um, uh, he doesn't want us to think of the political or democracy as simply a collection of imminent individuals, which what he already saw in the late '80s, and I think this is probably borne out, is that um, this is less than a version of politics as democracy as the thinking through of the community. But it's more a version of the political and democracy as simply like a technocratic management of society, of individuals, um, often according to their self-interest, which means often according to economics and, and, and the market and so on and so forth. Um, and he'll say, um, this is in your, in your ex excerpt, he'll say that the individual, this idea of the individual as this purely imminent atom, um, is the is merely the residue of the experience of the dissolution of community. So, the f for him the history of the individual of us coming to think ourselves as independent, you know, wholly formed things from which then we go out into society or into politics or do democracy and so on and so forth, actually is the symptom of a loss of community. Which is, which is fascinating. And once we get to the end of this session, I think this idea will be more clear. And there are two, there are two passages that I find really, really wonderful. Um, and he gets to like the critique of this imminent individual. He arrives at it in ways that I think are not self-evident, but they're very powerful. And the first is in this passage which might be one of the most difficult passages in, in the whole text, but one that stayed with me uh, ever since I first read it years ago. Um, and this is the passage where he talks about alone, like being alone, and the possibility of being alone and being absolutely alone, right? Because if there is such a thing as an imminent individual, one that's fully self-sufficient, then you, almost, you get the sense that this is a solitary figure, one that lives in in in, um, in solitude and can be um, absolute uh, is it's an absolute uh, figure or subjectivity so imminent and absolute in some ways are two terms they're different from each other but but they work in tandem here and so at one point he says um, the absolute must be the absolute of its own absoluteness or not be at all and in some sense that's like the the very definition of a totally self-enclosed individual um, identity. And then he continues, he says, in other words, to be absolutely alone, it's not enough that I be so. I must also be alone being alone. And this, of course, is contradictory. And I find this to be a very a puzzling, uh, thought-provoking and beautiful, beautiful passage. Um, and it would be wonderful to unpack it together and to, to sort of get everyone's impression of what they think he's doing here and what he's saying. The way I read this enigmatic passage um, is in some ways really quite literal. So what he's saying is that to be alone, to be absolutely alone, would entail being the only thing that exists. But that's impossible to think about. <laughs> 
uh, to be the only human being on, on the planet. It's, it's impossible for a number of reasons. One, because we're born from other human beings. Um, but for him, it's actually also logically an impossible. And why is that? Well, it's because to be alone, you have to be separated, separated from someone else, right? So think of, you know, you're alone in your room. You're alone in your room because there are other people in the world that are not in that room, right? But to be absolute, absolutely alone would be to be the only person, not only in your room, but anywhere. Which is, again, not only hard to think about and impossible to think about, but then actually you're no longer alone. Because the very definition of being alone is to be separate from others, right? So this is, this is the way I read it, and it's quite beautiful because through this really enigmatic, very difficult passage, what he's showing us is that what it is for us to be, what, what we are as existing entities, is relational, is social, um, um, is part of, of, a, of a community. Like We can't even think of ourselves as absolutely independent or absolutely alone or as absolute individuals. So it's a very beautiful, it's a very beautiful passage that gets to this idea. And as many references to death, which might also be a puzzling and difficult and abstruse, gets to the similar, gets to similar, a similar idea. So he's, he's playing off of two traditions here when he's talking about death in this text. And the first is from Heidegger. So Heidegger is very famous for, very, very well known for saying that death is the only thing that we can't share. It's a thing that we have to live through for ourselves. We can't give our death to someone else. We, we can outsource all so, sorts of things. We can outsource the making of our clothes, the preparing of our food, the making of our house, of our, of our shelter and our apartments, um, our, our intellectual activity. Like, you know, we, we outsource almost everything. Uh, at this at this point in history, but the one thing we can't outsource is our own death. Our being towards death is the for Heidegger the authentic mode of being, uh, because it's 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 what we it's what um, it's it's our fate. Death is also foundational for community, for Nancy, and this is is less about Heidegger, but it's more about Bataille, Georges Bataille. Um, so Heidegger was a German philosopher, if you don't know Heidegger, a German philosopher in the early 20th century, um, <laughs> very controversial uh, politically, to say the least, uh, but at the same time, one of the most important philosophers in the history of continental philosophy, especially the history of existentialism and phenomenology. Bataille, on the other hand, is a, he was a, a surrealist, a dissident surrealist, um, and one of, those, one of those philosophers that's actually hard to categorize. Um, but he spent a lot of time thinking about community, which is why he's such a big reference point for Nancy in this text, um, and thinking about uh, death. And Nancy picks up one of these ideas from, from Bataille, which is very simple, but in some ways, like I remember when I first encountered this idea, it was just something I never thought about. Uh, it just never occurred to me. We only come to know our death. We only come to know that we're, we're going to die by observing and seeing the death of the other. And here I like to leave it open. Like I think of primordial humans way, way in the past, uh, the very beginnings of hominization, um, and not only seeing themselves dying and then realizing that they're finite, that they're, gonna, they're also gonna die because they're you know, similar beings as these people that they're seeing dying around them. Uh, but maybe also death in the, in the broader sense, the death of non-humans, which of course they deem to be so important, which is why they're all over these caves. Um, these, these, these many thousands of years ago. Um, but, the fun, the, but the fundamental idea here is that uh, we only come to know our death through the death of the other, which is, if, if nothing else, it means that we come to know ourselves relationally, as embedded within a social uh, uh, communal space in which we identify and come to know about ourselves through the other. Right? So at first, this, this preoccupation with death may have been puzzling, but if you think about it as one more example and one more demonstration of the way in which uh, the pure individual is impossible, 
because the pure individual would, would already know about uh, everything about themselves and their death. Um, that's no, this is another instance of it being uh, a, a proof or a demonstration that, that being is not individuation but singularization, which is relational um, in a plural sense because we learn about ourselves through, through, through the other. So this is very important, and I've all, I've, this is not so much brought about in the text, but I've often uh, wondered, wondered about this. What would politics look like if we didn't die? Um, and for that matter, what would ethics and morality be without the condition of us being fragile, finite beings that, that will eventually perish, that will die? Um, I think it would fundamentally alter what politics and community even is, uh, even are. Um, not to mention ethics and, and morality, right? So fascinating to think through. But all of this is to say, this, this passage about uh, absolute aloneness and its impossibility, its actual logical, not only physical impossibility, but logical impossibility, um, along with this, this preoccupation of death as, as us being thrown into a situation where we, we only come to know ourselves through, through the other, all this is to say and to affirm that community is primordi primordially relational. Um, and there's a wonderful, there's another wonderful passage, uh, which I'll just read to you. I don't have it on, on the slide, uh, but it's also in, um, it's also in, in the preface where he says, this presupposes that we're brought into the world, each and every one of us, according to a dimension of in common that is in no way added onto the dimension of being self, but that is rather co-originary co and co-extensive with it. So the idea here is that we need to not think of ourselves as fully formed, that then, you know, we then uh, enact community by coming together, right? Uh, no, it's actually in many ways the other way around. Our, our being, our very being, our notion of self, our, our, our notion of, of, of being a singular entity is coextensive with. It emerges. Its origin is also uh, the origin of community, of, of being together, right? So this is very, very important for Nasi, and we're going to come back to the idea at, at the end. But, but first, let's go to the other side, right? Because I said there are two ways we want to approach this text. One is to think about him critiquing the notion of the absolute imminent individual. The other, and the, the one he spends the most time on, is, is uh, the impossible imminence of the collective. And here, he's not going after atomistic societies, Western, Western societies, but he's, he's going after uh, so the um, uh, communist societies, a really existing socialism of the 20th, 20th century. Um, and here's another moment where he quotes Bataille, though I don't give it to you. Bataille is well known for saying that the, the, the history of 20th century communism was a betrayal of community. And in many ways, what Nasi lays out for us shows how communism is a betrayal of community. Um, and it comes down to one really important idea, and it's the opposite of the atomization of society not the individual as, as this imminent, uh, perfect, absolute thing, but society itself as an individual, perfect, absolute thing. And so he says, this is in the, in the preface again, being in common has nothing to do with communion. So communion, there's, there's this idea of communion is, is like a, a fully coming together, like a falling into, e falling into each other. And there's, there's a, there's, a, there's quite a bit of preoccupation with the history of Christianity and Christian humanism in the text. And that'll make sense, a little more sense now, I hope, uh, because, of course, the history of Christianity is one of a community sort of being, being em embraced and falling into, um, you know, a condition of grace and the Holy Spirit and, and communion, right? Being, being all the, you know, the, the children of God, so, uh, so, so to speak. So for Nazi, being in common has nothing to do with, with that. Or, and this is the crucial passage here in this text that I'm giving you, 
with fusion into a body. So the idea of, of, of society, of all of us, um, of what it means to be a collective or a community, if we think of it as just us fusing into a body, like if you've ever seen the cover of Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan uh, of the king, and then his whole body is made up of all his subjects. Or on the right here, this is a well-known poster by Klutzis, uh, of, this, of the hand of the state being made up of the hand of the people. Um, this, this would be like the, 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 the fusing of the social body into one homogenous monolithic thing. Right, into a unique and ultimate identity. Um, for Nancy, this is, and going back to what we were saying a moment, a, moment, a moment ago, this is the history of totalization and totalitarianism, right? The collective body being one imminent thing. And maybe here we go back, we could go back a moment and think about uh, what we were talking about with the SI and my, my session on SI ethology, because in some ways, this is, this is arguing that what it means to be human or a human community is not, is precisely not to be a super organism, right? To be a, a, a collection of bodies that does one common thing. He says instead that being in common means to the contrary, no, no longer having in any form, in any empirical, physical, or ideal place, ideological, um, a substantial identity. And sharing this lack of identity is what, what uh, uh, being a community um, actually is, right? Uh, so to, to, th this graphs on or this matches his critique of the individual, but at the level of individual society. So if, um, if a society thinks of itself as uh, instantiating an essence, a common essence where everyone is working towards the, the same goal um, in this super organistic sort of way, then that's actually a collapse of community. That's a falling into a common uh, body, which is, I think we could fairly describe, um, a history of not only totalitarian communism, but fascism, right? The idea of, of, being, uh, of being a common body underneath the, 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 the dictates of the of the Führer in the case of Germany, um, um, and 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 Hitler, um, or but really any dictatorial uh, figure that conditions the whole of, of society, and so this is a, this is a really powerful critique. If the first uh, cri if the critique of the individual is a critique of atomistic Western societies, then this critique of the of society is this fused body. Uh, in which there's no space anymore between, uh, between the entities that are within society, uh, it just falls into this fascist totalitarian body, and this is a powerful critique of, of totalitarianism, right? And the, and the history of really existing um, socialism um, and communist states. And this, this is, it's important then to pause here to, to make sure that we understand that Nancy He's still working within, like in some ways, he's still faithful to the idea of communism. Uh, because for him, uh, and, and, uh, and for, for a lot of us actually, the, 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 the idea of socialism or communism or Marxism is the only thought that, that, put that put community into play, that tried to understand what it means to be equal and in common, right? It went horribly wrong which Bataille tells us and Nancy reaffirms, which is why to even think about community and collectivity has become problematic. I mean, we see this all the time. It's enough in this country to call someone a socialist on the news for the, for the conversation to completely stop, right? And, and completely end. Um, but for Nancy, it's important to, to work through these difficulties and not to let go of community because for him, as, as we've just seen, it's foundational not only to society, but also to our very, our very being, which is always re relational. And so this is where we get to um, his conception of community as inoperative. This is a weird word in many ways. And uh, if you read the translator's preface um, to, to the text, uh, 
if, if, if you ever read the, the whole text, he talks about how, how um, uh, désouvrer, the, the word in French, is hard to translate. Um, inoperative is the, way, is the way they went, but another way of, talk, of, 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 of translating this would be the unworked community. Um, and this works in, in, a, in, a, in, a couple, in, a, in a couple ways, um, which again is, is, is related to the sort of the two fronts uh, of, of this text. So rather than falling into an essential, absolute, imminent individual, the, um, the individual, uh, the idea of being a singular entity is something that's constantly unworking, uh, like working away at not falling into this pure atomistic individual or any notion of, of, of being an essential thing, of having an essence. Uh, because to have an essence is to presuppose that um, you, you're either there or you have a destination for yourself where you will, where you'll become complete, like you'll become what you were meant to be, right? Um, this, is, this is falling into a type of self-sufficient imminence that, that for, for Nancy is the, is the death of, of community, right? Um, and he mentions this at one point. He says the big problem with Marx uh, and the big problem with really existing socialism was to conceive of the human being as having an essence, namely of being a producer, of being a worker, right? So for, for Nancy, society needs to be made up of individuals that have no essence, um, uh, that, that they, they, they don't have this final teleological uh, mode of being that they'll finally then become full um, and that the that and that's the very precondition of community because everyone uh, lacks this essence and that's the one thing that they share. It's like you almost you, you know like you share this incompleteness, this unworking, and that's how community happens. Um, and there's uh, there's no essence of the community either. Either is the fascist body, the totalitarian body, the superorganism, or whatever. Like this teleological endpoint for uh, for, for the social body, that too, as we saw, is a form of, is a loss of, of community. You also want to think of this as like the loss of spacing between, between ourselves, between like singular entities in society. If you lose that spacing, you lose the singularity. You lose um, uh, what makes us uh, um, not individuals, but, 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 but entities that need to have space. Uh, between between other 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 entities, and so the unworking of community then is a type of unworking that keeps from it's a, it's a, it's it's a, a a type of unworking that keeps the community from collapsing into one imminent thing, right? And so the unworking, the the inoperativeness of the community both work works both at the individual level and at the at the at the level of the social. The social body, um, and he says this is this is um, uh, all. All of these the quotes are actually cited from the the, the book, um, and not from the excerpt because I was excerpting things that are not from the book. So, uh, but this is this is the last part of the book, uh, which is also the last part of the excerpt in in the anthology that you're reading from, where he finally gets to this, uh, the, his definition of the political. He says it would mean a community ordering itself to the unworking of its communication or destined to this unworking. A community consciously, this is the important part, a community consciously undergoing the experience of its sharing, of which writing and making art plays a key role. So these are, this, is, this is the hardest idea, I think, to, to, to understand in, in this text. And he keeps coming back to it. If you ever read this, this text in full, it's almost like he's working recursively. He's constantly coming back to this idea because it's so hard. It's so hard to write about. It's so hard to enunciate because um, community is not something that's presupposed for Nancy. It's not something that um, that you can. Uh, that so, it's not something that was made or that was worked on, and then you know, like we we arrived at it. Um, it's actually much more primordial than that. Um, um, community. Uh, sharing relationality, being being together, being in common, all uh, are exposed or are uh, instantiated from the get go. There, that's actually what makes uh, 
that what that's what makes our own self conception of being even possible in in the first place. Uh, going again, going back to that idea, the impossibility of being absolutely alone, and the fact that death plays such a pivotal role in our self conception, which unavoidably implicates the other. Um, yeah, so this is this is a very difficult difficult text. I hope um, the way I've worked through some of these passages, the way I've worked through some of these key terms, um, uh, will, will help you in, in the reading of the text. And when we do get together, I think it'll be fascinating not only to try to work through some of these ideas uh, more fully um, um, as, as, as a group, as a, as a, as a community of readers, um, uh, but also try to think through what are the ways in which the artists that we've looked at today and the artists that, that we'll be discussing when we get together, in what way were they, maybe they, did, you know, maybe they, they didn't put it this way, or you know, this is not an explicit thing uh, or an explicit preoccupation they had, but in what way was their work a type of unworking of the fascist totalitarian body, of trying to resist the collapsing or fusing into a super-organistic fascist totalitarian uh, social body that's I think that's the most important and interesting question for our purposes for for, for this session and, and the history that we're tracing